Welcome to Overdrive, the part of the show where we debate some of the hottest topics in NASCAR. As you can see, we have a special guest here in Jimmy Spencer standing in for Bob Dillner. I don't know if that's a great trade or not, but let's go ahead and get started. It was widely publicized that all three of the suspended crew chiefs this weekend were co communicating with their teams during the race. If they're still allowed to communicate, Jimmy, is it in fact even a suspension? Not really, because the, the way it's very easy to communicate today in our sport. So I would have NASCAR bring the suspended person into the event, have him under guard in a NASCAR hauler, in turn, bill, NASCAR bill the owner to pay for the crew chief, and then in turn, they know they have him controlled. Under, uh, so you want legalized kidnapping is what you That's want. That's not legalized kidnapping. Look, they have them under control. You got to get in the 21st century. Totally disagree. That's they, they way beyond the 21st century. Is, I think it's just fine the way it is, Jim. I have them under total control and they're underneath my watch. Oh, Lord. You know, with go. that being said, though, we all saw the penalties reduced dramatically last week. Is the combination of barely enforced suspension and penalty reduction sending a message to the garage they can get away with anything? Jimmy, what I like is it went to the appellate board, it went to John Middlebrook, the system worked, leave it alone, we don't need to change it, I think it worked just fine. I disagree with you, and the reason why I say that, Matt, is this. Think about the appellate board. These guys that are hearing these cases, they're not few, former car owners, drivers, mechanics, they never even worked on cars. One was a truck salesman, oh, now you're getting and the other personal. one was a track promoter. That's too personal, I Jimmy. think that NASCAR needs to get more skilled, more current guys in there that's more familiar with our sport. I might give you a tick on that, but not much. Saturday night, we saw Kyle Busch and Casey Kane involved in yet another incident on the track. It's the third time this year these guys have gotten together. Could there be a rivalry brewing between these two? No, you know, they've been together three times this year. Daytona, Talladega last week, and Darlington Saturday night. I think it's more hard race inning. At least Kyle Busch did agree that he did cause the wrecks at Daytona and Talladega. But Saturday night at Darlington, I think it was just pure hard racing, baby. Both of them racing hard. I don't think there's a rivalry at all. Well, look, man, if you're the five guys, you're definitely upset because there you go. Three times you got wrecked by the same guy. Now, I know Roddy's a heck of a racer, but look, three times you had a chance to close a race. That's nine bonus points if you won the race towards a chase. I mean, look, they have to be upset, Jimmy. I, I believe they're upset, but all in all, I still think it's just good hard racing. And hard racing, all-star race this weekend. There's plenty up for grabs with the potential. Two million bucks on the line. Give me the cash. Should there be more for winning this race than just the money? Absolutely, Jimmy. You know I'm not a traditionalist, so I think these guys should at least get a point towards the chase for winning this race. The time they put in, the effort, more than money, give them something towards the chase. I agree with you, but one point? No, Matt. They are locked in to the chase. For one race... Oh, man. Jimmy, think look, about you the said some crazy race, things, man. but that is absolutely oh. insane. No. You're talking about no. charity, not a That's chance. That's not charity. They beat the past winners. My God, think about how hard it is to win this race. It's exciting. All right, look. Reward them with a shot at the chase. Look, that's enough. We've had enough spirit of debate here, Spence. What do you got next, brother? Hey, I'm awarding a cigar to one of the best there is, and you won't want to miss the best of Kurt Busch Scanner from Darlington. It's up next on oh, no. Dig themselves out of a hole. Let's call these the Dirty Dozen. Among the drivers at a disadvantage are Brian Vickers, who finished 30th on Sunday. Danica Patrick, she couldn't repeat her 500 performance from a year ago. She got caught up in that big one on lap 40, 145. Now, who are the top five that had probably the worst problems on Daytona 500 Sunday? Well, let me go to the board. I'm going to need you a little help All right. with this first one. You got really long arms. Who do you want? Uh, Casey Kane in the five car. Right. He's number five. You know, they had a self-inflicted problem early in the race, and late in the race, they had an issue. He had to speed down pit road to keep getting run over. Bad start at Daytona 500. Then ended up having a bigger problem later. So just a bad 500 altogether. Who's number four? Number four? Uh, I think I can get him, Tony Stewart. Uh, Needed a good run, long off season, big injury. They needed a little momentum. I think having a bad day for them ended up really being not a good thing at all. Mechanical issues for Tony. How about number three? Uh, uh, number three, uh, Clint Boyer. is a team that, you know, obviously, Switch look at rounds. that. Look at that. That's fancy. There. A team that obviously had a lot of issues and, you know, after Richmond last year. They need a good, strong start. The whole MWR team, honestly, had a, had a really bad day, Tone of 500. So I think they needed it pretty badly. Engine failure for Clint Boyer. Who's number two? Number two is a guy that I think didn't receive enough uh, uh, credit for what happened at Daytona. Uh, okay. and how well he ran. I thought that Paul Menard and his team may have had the fastest car on the racetrack for a large portion of the time. 
and they ended up with a 32nd place finish yeah. to show for it. Really disappointing finish. They were really, really fast. I thought they had a chance to win the race. Who's your number one? Number one, and uh, again, you'll have to help me with this one. He's a long way away. Martin Truex. Uh, Got him. Here's a guy that is on a roller coaster ride. Yeah. I mean, last year he was in the chase. He was out of the chase. He has a ride. He doesn't have a ride. He, 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 he's got, he didn't even go test Daytona. They come down, sit on the outside pole. They wreck a car in the 150s. They get a car out, it's really fast. Finishes dead last. I mean, you're talking about an emotional roller coaster. This guy has been on one. And all these five will have an uphill battle if they want to get into the chase at the end of the season. Now, winning at a premium this year when we decide the championship, winners will populate the top 16 spots for the challenge round of the elimination style format. So, of course, now we've changed over to populating 16 positions. And of those 16 positions, we're going to show you 20 of them. Marcus Ambrose, Kyle Busch, Terry Labonte, Kurt Busch. Those guys are all on the outside looking in as we already have our first winner of the season with Dale Earnhardt Jr. And yeah, don't think for a minute they're not all thinking about that. They want to win races. They know if they win races, they're most likely going to be in the chase. But at the end of the day, winning races is what they all care about. But points still matter, right. man. Don't think they don't. And winning doesn't automatically you don't have to win to be in the 16 because up to this point i believe it's an average of around 12.5 drivers have won races in the first 26 races to get to the chase so obviously you don't have to win to get in points are going to be important that's exactly right so you're going to have between i think three and five teams that transfer in because of where they are in points not every team that is in the chase is just going to get there because of wins so points matter there's no question they matter all right, still to come, we'll hear from the Chase Leaders crew chief and maybe the hottest driver's crew chief. We'll tell you what a window, a flap, and rubbish have in common. But up next, it's time to scan all 43. It's got some fun here. Keep in it, keep in it, keep in it. Stay to the bottom. Check up, check up, check up. Good job. Video. So let's listen in as we relive the Daytona 500 and scan all 43. The Great American Race. NASCAR Super Bowl. Whatever you call it, the Daytona 500 is Stock Car's most prestigious event. And the 43 drivers who run its grueling 500 miles know firsthand what a win means. That's it, boys. Let's focus forward. Hold out there. Have the fun. Turn! Start your engine! Fired up with new engine. Fired up. All right, buddy. Have you some fun out there. All right, guys. Let's be on our toes all day. 43 hungry drivers hoping this will be their year. Green flag, green flag, green flag. As the season kicks off, Daytona filters out the week right from the beginning. Somebody's already got into something. It's in the fence. Don't get run over. Got the wall on the one. Got fire down. It's a long way to go. We'll be fine. Oh, he's in the wall here. I just had a flat. I just got the fence. A little bit off the corner. Blew up. We just blew up, guys. With two cautions and 38 laps in the books, it was Mother Nature's turn to spoil the party. It's going to rain, I think, pretty good. Slow down, Brent. We're going to come down pit road. It took over six hours for the weather to clear, pushing the 500 into prime time for the second time in three years. But the wait was worth it. Keep an eye out up front. Make sure this guy's not doing anything crazy. That's and if he wants to cause a big threat, keep driving the way he's driving. Watch the water here, watch the water. So I gotta be the to thank NASCAR for letting us race with a fucking wet pit road. We gotta pass your penalty, bud. We gotta pass our pit stop. That bad, and we drug out. Hey, man. Looks like a bunch of monkeys this week. I don't know what we got going on, bud, but it's, it acts like it's just out of fuel. Every lap, it gets worse and worse and worse. I want something spinning behind you. Keep rolling, keep rolling. Roll fast, roll fast, roll fast, roll fast. All right, they got us for too fast entering. We were gonna get run over by a wrecked car because of their wet pit road and you're going to penalize us? Something's wrong. Showing up now. Is it broke? It's got some pit road time. With more weather approaching and time running out, drivers begin to push the limits. It's got spawn here. Keep it in it. Keep in it. Keep in it. Stay to the bottom. Check up. Check up. Check up. Good job. Good job. Back it down. Back it down. Nice and smooth. I think we're done. That was a hell of a hit right there. Oh, man. What the hell happened? It opens. We're going to still get a little bit of gas. It's probably to the left. And then we're going to need a splash to get to the end. Right side on the jack. Leave on the jack. Leave on the jack. Clear all, clear all, clear all, clear. No pressure. Kyle Larson! 
Anderson is around, and they're crashing behind him. Michael Lynette, Marcus Ambrose, uh, several other cars. Hang on to it. No caution. Go. One lap down. Am I the only one here? No, we got you. Yes, one lap down. How many cars? One lap down. You and the nine. Big wreck. Caution down. Keep coming there. Safe fuel. Get a run of safe fuel. Hey, you need to get right up behind the pace car. Something come up on our grill. 88's got a big piece of bear bond covering up half his grill. He's going to be real fast out front. Tell Jeff to push me all the way into one. You want drama? We've got it. Dale Earnhardt Jr. trying to get away. Jr. showing no problem whatsoever. He has the field in tow. There's a big wreck in your mirror. The 11's not clear. Keep coming, bud. You're going to do it. You're going to win it. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has won the Daytona 500 for the second time. Oh, yeah! Woo! Yes! What a day! One of the voices you just heard is going to join us. Steve Letarte, Dale Earnhardt's crew chief, goes one-on-one -on -one with the mayor, Jeff Burton. NASCAR America, back after this. It's normally hard to grab time with the mayor, but here on NASCAR America, we've cleared a few minutes in his schedule and thought that he best spend it with, you know, the Daytona 500 winning crew chief, which is Steve Letarte. He's standing by on the phone. Hey, Steve, thanks for joining us. And first of all, congratulations on a Daytona 500 win. You know, one of the things that stands out when I think about you is that you've had almost every job within a cup team, but I want to know, what does it feel like to be the winning crew chief for the Daytona 500? Well, Jeff, you know, that's the, the million-dollar question. I'm not sure what it feels like quite yet. It's, it's only been, you know, a, a day and a half or two days, but uh, you kind of dream at night what it would be like to win that race, and then when it happens, it happens so fast. I don't think I've really been able to kind of get my brain around it yet, but... Um, but it's nice. It's nice. It's ready to go. I'm ready to go to Phoenix, so I'm ready to get back into the rhythm a little bit and um, see all your peers in the garage, and then maybe it'll set in a little bit better. Well, that's a racer's mentality, right? Go to the next race. Well, since you brought Phoenix up, let me, let me talk about it a little bit. How does winning the 500 and pretty much solidifying your spot in the chase, how does that change your Phoenix outlook, and does it change how you're going to race the rest of the year? Well, it definitely reduces the stress for Phoenix, um, without a doubt. You know, um, Phoenix is a track, it's a short race, you know, it's down in the 300 mile category, um, it's a tricky one mile track, but since the repave, the strategy at Phoenix has been very, very tough, you know, tire fall off is very minimal, um, you got to be really courageous with your fuel strategy, we watched Carl Edwards run out of gas late in the, in the Phoenix race in the fall, and I think our Daytona 500 win is going to allow us to take whatever gamble necessary to give the 88 a chance at victory lane, and that's something we maybe couldn't say in years past, but with the chase and the way we qualified, hopefully this year so far with one win, we know two wins would be 100%, and um, that would also count for some bonus points early in the chase. So we're going to try all we can through the summer to win as many as we can. All right, well, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but it's fun, so I'm going to. Tell me, you know, when in the off season, what was your biggest fear and what still is your biggest fear about this upcoming season? You know, it's always the, the biggest fear of any crew chief is just the unknown and the momentum. And what I mean by that is when, when, when Dale and I for, were first joined together in 2011, our goal was to be, be relevant and be on TV for a reason other than because he's Dale Earnhardt Jr. And we did that. In 2012, we won a race. That was our next goal. That was great. 2013, it was bittersweet. You know, it was sweet because we had a great performance. We made the chase. We ran well. But it was a little bitter because we didn't get that victory. And, and while even without that victory, we call 2013 a success, the fear coming to 2014 is can we build on that? Can we win multiple races? Can we compete in the chase? And a Daytona 500 victory surely eases quite a bit of that fear. And if anything, will give us a lot of motivation to, to be able to accomplish our goal. Well, again, Steve, thank you for being with us, and I uh, really look forward to working with you in the future. All right, guys, appreciate you having me on. It's been a fun week, but uh, like I said, we're excited to get to Phoenix, relax a little bit, and get back on the racetrack. All right, two interviews and two shows. Are you trying to get rid of me? First, but where does the victory stack up overall in his NASCAR career? We want you to give us our opinion. That's the poll question for this week. Let us know what you think. Head to foxsports.com slash racehub and cast your vote. We will have the poll results on Friday. Well, Danielle, so much for that whole lame duck crew chief thing, huh? Steve Letard is leaving at season's end to join NBC. So is this season an opportunity for Dale Earnhardt Jr. to achieve maximum success? Well, it sure looks like it. 
also an opportunity for Steve Letart. Caitlin Vincey sat down with Steve after the big 500 win. Dale's second, but Steve's first. 2014 is kind of a year of last opportunities, per se, for you and Dale. What does it mean to you to be able to cross off winning the Daytona 500 <laughs> as a crew chief from your bucket list? Well, I said it in the media center. You know, it's, it's um, rare or lucky, or I don't know how you say it, that I kind of got a career-defining race win in my final year. And, um, you know, I'm thankful to this group of guys. It's a great group of guys. Thankful to Dale Jr. He did a great job. Mr. Hendrick gave us all the equipment, so it's, um, I mean, it's big. It's, um, I don't really know yet. I can't even explain it quite yet. You mentioned, you know, it's a career-defining moment, winning the Daytona 500, but I also saw some of your posts that your family was there with yeah. you, a picture of your son, Tyler. So what was it like having your family with you in Victory Lane sharing this huge moment in your career? Well, I think that's what really made it special. You know, I mean, winning is, is great, but having those guys there were, was... Um, I ran around Pet Road trying to find my wife, and she was already in Victory Lane, so I, I got to see her and give her a hug and a kiss and see my kids. And the best part of any victory is the moment they jump off pit wall or the moment the driver gets out of the car in Victory Lane and you see the excitement in the guys' faces and how much work they put in. You know, there's so many very special individuals that make up a team, and to see them and the relationship I have with them all, when I see that moment for them, that was really what made it all special. You mentioned all that excitement, but also there were some nerves before the <laughs> end of the race. Are you having fun? It's kind of fun out there. Yeah, but this is for a big prize, man. It's hard not to be nervous. It's hard to enjoy it. That's why I asked, because I wasn't really enjoying it. I've seen a few worse. I'm enjoying particular pieces of it, but the entire experience is driving me crazy. So as a crew chief, how do you keep your driver calm and collected in a situation like that? Obviously a very high pressure situation. Well, I guess it, I don't know. I try not to give away my secrets, you know. Uh, when I asked him in the closing laps, you know, was he having fun? That was really kind of by design. That wasn't just an off the cuff question. I try to um, put myself in his shoes. I try to know him very well. And I understand maybe where his mind is or what he's thinking about. And if I don't think he's maybe thinking about all the stuff he needs to, then I'll, I'll sometimes get off topic. And that's maybe some of my signature. If the people scam me a lot, they'll realize there's a lot of random statements. Um, and, and while they may be random to the fans, and Dale might even think they're random to him, they're not really random to me. You know, they're, uh, there's a reason for it all, and, and it worked. He, he, he was in the game, he did great. Well, he certainly rose to the task at hand, and now when we look at the rest of the year, you guys already have a win. You're locked into the chase, where in the past we've seen this 88 team having to race their way into the chase at Richmond. So how much of a relief is it for you to be like, hey, we're already in this thing? <laughs> a lot. A major relief, especially with the new rules. You know, there's a lot of stress. People don't understand the stress the crew chiefs are under and the teams are under going to Phoenix with this new rule package. There's not a day of testing. Phoenix is a very hard racetrack to get a hold of anyway. So, you know, there's a lot of built-up pressure. And then the pressure's coming here probably a little lower for the 88 when we go to Phoenix. We're going to have a lot more smiles, um, enjoy ourselves, and, and hopefully, just like we talked about during the race and kind of your mental aspect, I'm, I'm hoping that the same sort of relief. You know, I think we saw it in the chase. We had a down race at Chicago, and people can say, well, we would have won the championship if it wasn't for Chicago, and I might argue, well, maybe we wouldn't have been as good if it wasn't for Chicago, because it kind of took the pressure off, and we saw how good we could perform, and I feel that's kind of where we sit for the whole 2014 season now. Well, Dale winning the Daytona 500 was a huge news point. The other huge news point was him joining Twitter. I know, I know you're very active on social media already, so he said he's kind of a rookie, doesn't know what he's <laughs> doing. Do you plan on giving him some Twitter lessons? I think he lies. I think he's... Um, More well-versed than he lets he's, on? He's probably one of the most eloquently written people I know. When he writes his emails, his text messages, he, he finds a way to capture the moment. And, you know, when he took a couple of those selfies and put them out, I can assure the fans, you know, those aren't prompted. Right. That's not a, a PR staff saying, oh, this would be a cool one. You don't even know he's doing it. You know, like, like he's walking, oh, hold on a minute. And he's hitting on the phone. I'm like, man, what are you doing? I just thought that was a cool picture. I'm going to get on him, though. I mean, six tweets, and I haven't mentioned one of them yet. I mean, how can I And he's not my... following I mean, how yet. can I follow? Well, I see, he's probably not going to follow anyone, but he can at least, you know, I mean, help a guy out. I mean, I'm trying to work on my social media yeah, group. I, I, mean, I broke 100,000 at the Daytona 500. So uh, one of the other coolest things about the race when it ended is, you know, all your friends have your phone number and the text messages were amazing. But you go to Twitter and you all have all these people that don't maybe have your phone number, but when you see all these famous people that have tweeted directly to you, right. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, it's cool to think that we made that big a ripple in the world of sports. Huge ripple. Well, we look forward to you and Junior's future selfies and best <laughs> of luck this season. Thanks so much. Steve. Thank you.
And Ray Dunlap and I have breaking news. <laughs> he is following Steve Letarte now. <laughs> you, you know, we talked with Danielle about the, the significance, the, the impact that Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s victory has. I, I think great evidence of that is he got a, a, a message from RG3, Robert Griffin III, the quarterback of the Washington Redskins. He says, congrats to my friend at Dale Jr. on winning the Daytona 500. Much love, brother. Hashtag Daytona 500. And Dale Jr. is a huge Redskins fan. That right there, that says a lot. Keep in mind, Steve, the sports world watches other sports yep. okay we all love that that's what we do we're in sports because it's part of what we are but when people watch Dale Earnhardt win that race and they get on Twitter and start talking about it to me it's it, it's about the love and the feel what I loved about listening to Steve Letarte's talk though it wasn't just about he and his family it was about the team and he said you know I shared it with the guys on my team that's what's special to me because it may be the last time he ever crew chiefs a Daytona 500 to your point there are two families to talk about here. One is the team of the 88, which is a family. Right. But also his family. And he talked about having his kids and his wife there in Victory Lane. The move to the broadcast booth gives him more time with his family. You know, you can't argue with that. But it's hard to replace the juice yeah. of winning a Daytona 500. Well, just... just organizing a team what I think that people forget is how much effort it goes into being a crew chief I mean a TV job's a 30 hour week a crew chief's an 80 hour week yeah. okay these guys never stop and and at midnight he's on his iPod or on a, on the computer answering emails to guys about questions they have it, it's a job that never ends so I think it'll be a big change for him but man you got the Daytona 500 trophy so you know now all he's got to do is win a championship I was gonna say that's the last <laughs> thing Danielle all right, so guys, check this out. Hendrick Motorsports has won the Daytona 500 eight times, right? But how did each driver fare the following race? As we head to Phoenix, we wanted to break down the numbers. You can see Jeff Gordon, the only driver to break through to victory lane just seven days later. That, of course, coming at Rockingham. Jimmy Johnson has gotten close twice. Did it in 2006 at Auto Club. And again, last year, coming off his second Daytona 500, finishing second at Phoenix. Dale Earnhardt Jr. looking for his third win in the desert. The last time he got to victory lane there, was in 2004. So today, the quest for the UEFA Champions League glory continues. Ray Dunlap will be watching. Uh, the first of two matches begins, right, Ray? Yeah. 2 p.m. Eastern on Fox Sports 1 and Fox Sports 2. Football. Coming up, Regan Smith started his 2014 season. Focus on the Cup rookies for a moment. Is this a two-man battle between these two guys? Well, I think everybody believes it is, and I think there's reason to believe that. And tell you what, pull these guys up. Let's compare them a little bit. You know, both of these drivers, I think, are, are really equal. I think they both can compete at a high level. They've shown it in the past and, and what they've done. Both of their teams are strong. Uh, you've got Chris Heroy with, with third-year experience. Right. Gil Martin, crew chief, long-time experience. But I really look at, at what's going on, and I think these two teams, both teams compete. And I think it's going to boil down to these two drivers. All right, so we've got Austin Dillon. He's got a couple championships, a Truck Series championship, a Nationwide championship. Anybody else we could add to this, or is it going to be just well, two? One guy I want to give some mention to, and I, you know, I watched him last year uh, driving, driving this car right here. I was really impressed Parker with, with Parker Clickerman. Parker Clickerman and yeah. what he did when he got in that 30 car. Immediately when he got in that car, it started performing better running in the front, finishing the lead lap in one of the races. I don't think this team has the funding. Well, I know they don't have the funding to these other two teams. I don't think they can compete with them day in and day out, but I believe this guy right here can get it done. Three good choices for our top rookies. Now, this rookie class is reminiscent of your rookie class, actually, from 1994. A lot of talented drivers have been. Now, we head off to Phoenix. It's our first downforce track of the year, and one of the big things that has taken place in 2014 is the changes to the setup of the car, Jeff. A really big change, and this is, this is a kind of a monumental change. NASCAR has always, in the past, made cars go through tech at a certain height. And you can see here how high the splitter is off the ground. NASCAR would measure that splitter. NASCAR would measure the side skirts. Uh, as we see here, NASCAR would measure the quarter panel heights, the roof height, and do all those things. Okay, they're still doing those things, but the, what the teams like to do is they like the car to look like this. They like the car on the racetrack to be sealed off, right. splitter on the ground, the side skirts lower, the right side skirt to be sealed off to the racetrack, okay? You can see those wheels are stuck up in the wheel wells. The reason the teams want that is because that's the most downforce. The, most down, the more downforce you can have, the better they drive. So this is what it looked like before. Tech, on, on pre-tech, post-tech, post-race, all those things, 
and then this was on the racetrack. Right. Today, cars are going to still go through tech like this, okay? But the teams are going to be allowed to pull spacers out as soon as they go through tech, and they're going to get the car down, okay? It may not be all the way down like this, but it's going to be real close. Right. So the reason that NASCAR has done that is teams have spent an exorbitant amount of money developing really exotic springs to take a car that's up in the air like this, get it to travel like this, and then stay like that. Because you want it like this on the straightaway, but travel you to also this want level, it in the corners. Travel to this level, but not hit the track, right? That's correct. So you, you, you just get to that limit. So also, we saw a lot of teams being penalized over the years going through tech after the race. They weren't cheating. They just made a mistake, or they had a, they had a spring fade a little bit or, or, or soften up. They would, fail, they would fail tech. So it was harder for NASCAR to police. It was harder for the teams. Hopefully, this will make it easier for both parties. And the goal is to get as much air over the top of the car as possible. You want downforce. The more downforce, the better the car is driving. We've seen it makes for better racing. All right. Now, Phoenix was repaved in 2011. Yesterday, you had mentioned that because of that repave, that was going to change the way pit stop strategy took place. How so? Well, it's huge. Phoenix used to be a track that tires would wear out quickly. Every time the caution would wave, people are on pit road putting on tires. We don't see that today. We see two tire strategies. We see no tire strategies. If you don't need fuel, sometimes you'll just stay out. You know, so fuel has become more important than tires. The reason why is the new asphalt. Okay. The new asphalt is much, much less grit in it than the old asphalt. It's a polymer type asphalt is what they call it. The rocks, the aggregate are very small and very close together. So I, I've got some props today. Okay. okay. It's Show play and tell day. day. Friday is play day. Sure. So my man Benji has, has brought me a prop. Thank you, All Benji. All right. Thank you. Old racetrack. Okay. Very, very rough. New racetrack, much smoother. So old racetrack, drive the car on the racetrack. Very coarse. Okay. This is what happened to the tires. It would eat the tires up. Okay. Lots of grit in the racetrack. New racetrack, new asphalt. Hardly nothing happens. Anything. I mean, yeah. nothing happens. So you end up not wearing tires out. And a lot of times we see at Phoenix and also these newer paved racetracks, the, the cars actually go quicker after being on the racetrack for a few laps. So that has completely changed the way you race Phoenix. I love the fact you've brought cheese in. What goes best with cheese? Uh, in my house? Wine. Benji? Wine? <laughs> that guy is sharp, let me tell you. this was NASCAR America. <laughs> he is very NASCAR. quick. NASCAR. <laughs> well, it's not wine and cheese for the drivers, though. More on the new qualifying rules and some late night fun still to come. Jamie McMurray, he was voted. Most likely to be Lord Voldemort before his botched nose job. That's a very, not a bad looking guy. Clint Boyer, he was voted most likely to play Han Solo in an off-Broadway version of Star Wars the Musical. I've got a bad feeling about this. Chewy. Stand by for Titanfall. Guys, we're just under two hours until we get to see that first qualifying session in Phoenix. You know, the drivers of NASCAR haulers have been earning their money. They made a 475-mile trek from Charlotte to Daytona and then back again. Then they made a 2,110-mile journey to PIR, which is located in Avondale, Arizona. After Phoenix, it's a 295-mile ride to Las Vegas for a total of 3,355 miles. Once they get home, it's over 5,500 miles, and that's time for an oil change. One of the teams that has to make this trip is Joe Gibbs Racing, and today our Kelly Stavis is there. Hey, I'm just helping the boys at Joe Gibbs Racing getting Kyle Busch's car loaded and ready to head west. Now, you might be wondering why we're loading cars today when they're already on the track in Phoenix. Well, this is Kyle's car for Las Vegas. And the goal is to get all the Joe Gibbs Racing Vegas cars out of Huntersville, North Carolina today and into Las Vegas by Monday morning. That's when they'll make the swap with the primary haulers. They'll trade cars, team uniforms, and other track essentials. Now, for a big team like Joe Gibbs Racing, they have the luxury of owning two four-car haulers so they can get the job done by themselves. But for smaller teams like Tommy Baldwin Racing and Fast Lane Racing, among others, well, they've had to join forces to rent car haulers to get their Vegas cars out west. But these first five weeks of the season with races from coast to coast and so many miles logged, it's really the hauler drivers that are sort of the unsung heroes in the garage area. Guys. Yeah, Kelly, it's surprising how many people are behind the scenes that make these teams work. Yeah, big shout out to the hauler, to the hauler drivers. Those guys, I mean, they're, they're doing it all the time. Late nights, early mornings, they really get a lot done. And then you think about it, 
there's more people in these teams that don't go to the racetrack sure. than there are that do go to the racetrack. So, so many people, you never hear their names on TV. Without them, these race teams are nothing. And they start from scratch with these cars. I mean, you've got a, a chassis that you start with. You hang the bodies. They put the engines in. I mean, there's so many things that go on behind the scenes. Yeah, and one little mistake by someone at the shop, and it ruins it for everybody. So everybody is important. Everybody is important. Coming up, we bring tickets. Okay, Jeff, yesterday you left me hanging on your pick. You had five guys that you thought had a chance of winning. Let's narrow it down. I didn't tell you yesterday because I wasn't real sure. I had to think about it a little <laughs> more. But, you know, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a couple guys off the board. All these guys are potential winners, but I'm going to start with the 11 okay. and, and the 18. The reason why, this track is suited to those guys. But last year's fall race, they just didn't show it. So they're going to have to prove to me that they can get it done. All right. All right, now I'm going to need a little help. Okay. I'm going to take Jimmy Johnson off the board. All right, and, I'll take and care of that. Even though he's a multi-time champion, he just hadn't shown it to me on the new surface either. So we're down to these two guys, the two most recent winners. All right. And I just see in Kevin Harvick a determination wanting to prove that he can do it. So take Carl Edwards off the board. Sorry, Carl, nothing personal. But <laughs> the, the bottom line is that Kevin Harvick, when he's determined, when he wants to prove to the world he can do something, he's going to do it. And I think that team is capable, even though they're new together. I just see these guys stepping up early in their early in their relationship together, making something big happen right off the bat. All right. So the mayor has picked Kevin Harvick to win this weekend in Phoenix. You know, the viral video that's sweeping the industry, that's coming up next. As we go to break, it's our Heart of America, different tracks, series, and stars. Today, we celebrate the mentors in the heart of racing. From Watermelon Capital Speedway in Cordill, Georgia, how about Virginia Motor Speedway in Jamaica, Virginia? To Orange County Fair Speedway in Rougemont, North Carolina. We tip our hats to you for keeping the heart beating. NASCAR America continues next.